All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to UDLIRN Network and Learn series, or good afternoon if you're in Pacific time zone like I am. Uh, tonight's topic is the relationship between UDL and inclusive practices for individuals with severe intellectual disability. Uh, I'm Alex Hollingshead. I'm an assistant professor of special education at the University of Idaho, and I'm uh, on the professional development committee at the UDL IRN. And we have three fabulous panelists tonight, Dr. Stacy Diamond from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Dr. Colleen Thoma from Virginia Commonwealth University, and Dr. Laron Scott from Virginia Commonwealth University. And I apologize, uh, the advertisement said that Dr. Mike Waymeyer will be able to join us, but unfortunately he had to cancel. Um, so these three fabulous panelists will share with you all uh, their thoughts and experiences related to inclusive practices for students with um, severe intellectual disability as well as to uh, UDL implementation. <clears throat> Uh, during our session, please post your comments and your questions on Twitter using hashtag UDLIRN. And um, without much farther from me, I guess, uh, I will invite Dr. Colleen Thoma to, to, to start our session. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, UDL. Um, some, it's a new topic that we're looking at um, related to providing access to the general ed curriculum. It's also a tool that really could be used to help support the inclusion of students with intellectual disability and particularly those um, with more significant support needs. Okay, next. So let's look at that from the big picture of inclusive education today. Let's talk about it in context. These are some of the things that um, schools are facing and some of the pressures. So the idea of increasing academic rigor and standards. How do we make sure that students are learning um, rigorous academic content, are being expected to learn those, and are being measured in their progress according to those standards? Um, some states use um, the Common Core as a way of doing that. Other states have developed their own approaches to it. Um, Virginia, where I am, is one that has their own standards, um, the standards of learning. Um, but it's all related to thinking about how do you keep these high standards for students. And along with that comes this idea of increasing accountability for teachers and schools. So how do we um, how do we keep track of student progress and how do we use that information to decide which teachers are doing a good job, which schools are doing a good job? Um, you know, obviously those, um, those standards or those assessments are being used in ways that they, for which they were not designed, but that doesn't change the fact that that's a reality for a lot of the teachers um, in our schools. With the change in process, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> head back, yeah, thank you. With the change in leadership at the Department of Education, we now also have increased interest in school choice. This idea of parents being able to make decisions about which schools they would send their son or daughters to based on um, options such as charter schools, using vouchers to move from one school to uh, a low performing school to a higher performing school or doing some homeschooling. Um, so this is a switch from this idea of common high standards for all to standards that parents choose um, and academic and other kinds of instruction, again, that parents choose. Um, and then there's the idea of college and career readiness. How do we make sure that as students are leaving high school, they're ready for either um, going on to college or they're ready with academic skills to make them successful in their jobs? Okay. And obviously that is in contrast to the way we've normally offered special special education, individualized education, 
where our focus has been on individualized education goals that have been chosen specifically for students based on their, um, their needs, their support needs, and where they are academically at the time. Um, measuring student progress, not based necessarily on standards, but on achieving those goals that have been identified by that IEP team. And then for secondary level students, thinking about where do they want to end up after high school and how do we develop services and instruction that prepare them to get there. Um, might be things that are in line with college and career readiness, or it may be something um, that expands that idea to include things like um, recreation and leisure and social skills and interacting with others. Thanks. And these are some of the strategies. Some of these are evidence-based, um, research-based strategies. Some of these are promising practices, but these are some of the strategies that teachers use in order to help students reach those individualized goals. So of course, self-determination, um, you know, I had to add that in there since Mike's not here to talk about this himself, um, but self-determination is helping students become causal agents in their own um, academic life as well as their own life outside of school, thinking about how do they set um, set goals for themselves, how do they solve problems, how do they achieve goals and measure their own progress towards goals. Then we have um, accommodations and modifications, which are types of adaptations that teachers use in order to deliver instruction or to measure student performance. Sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, but modifications are those things where um, we change what's being taught, or what's expected from a student, um, things like simplifying an assignment or giving another um, option for an assignment. Or there's accommodations where there's a change that helps a student um, overcome the impact of their disability. So it might be for a student who has a difficult time um, writing, they may use a um, computer to do assignments, they might use voice input, um, voice recognition, those kinds of software tools to help. Differentiated instruction um, sometimes is used interchangeably um, with UDL, but differentiated instruction is making some changes to the instruction, but it's based on individual student needs instead of the UDL approach, which is more, um, it's universal, more um, designed to meet the needs of a range of students. And then the functional transition curriculum that might be there, thinking about how do we prepare students for jobs after high school? How do we make sure they understand how to take a bus, um, how to pay their bills, those functional kinds of things that sometimes can be um, seen as um, different from academic instruction. Okay. This comes from a, um, a table that was published in a, a book on inclusive education and transition um, by Grossi and, and Cole. They talk about nine types of adaptations, and I won't go through all of these, but when we think about how do we adapt or modify, you can see that quickly teachers are looking at multiple ways of helping students learn, um, all the way from just coming up with different ways that we would teach instruction and input, giving them more time on instruction, all the way to adaptations that mean teaching a different curriculum from the general ed curriculum. Okay. And then as I said earlier, differentiated instruction is something that um, comes from a researcher, um, Carol Tomlinson, um, and she talks about ways that instruction itself can be changed um, but again this is the focus on individual students so um, five ways that she talks about differentiating either differentiating the content what's taught to students or how they access the information the process so how are we going to be teaching and how are students going to make sense of the instruction um, the products or the assessments that are used, so how does the student demonstrate what they know? 
um, affect, you know, how do you really tap into student motivation and link them um, and increase their motivation to learn? And then the adaptations that look at the learning environment itself, how is the classroom set up? Do we have space for um, learning groups? Do we have technology? Um, how close are things? Do students have enough room to navigate around the classroom? So these are some of the challenges. Um, Laron and I did a study with, a, with one of our other former doctoral students, Katie Best, that looked at um, teacher perceptions of universal design and transition planning. Um, and these are some of the challenges that they addressed. These also identify some of the challenges that we've heard anecdotally as we've spoken with teachers. Um, so at times, teachers are having a difficult time really making the connection between academic and functional curriculum. They're still thinking that those are mutually exclusive, um, or even if they think there could be links, um, they're struggling with how to make that real. They're also struggling with seeing how a student's individual learning needs um, and the general ed curriculum can be linked. Um, you know, can this student really learn the general ed curriculum? Is it really um, valuable or necessary for them to do that when we have all these other needs we need to address? They're also challenged with thinking about how to make those modifications and adaptations for individual students in the context of the larger class. Um, you know, the more students with disabilities, um, and learning challenges you have included in the class, the more difficult it becomes to layer on all those individual modifications. And as students change and as content changes, those modifications and adaptations need to change. And so there, you know, there's this frequent change and movement happening um, that they describe as quickly becoming ugly and overwhelming. It's kind of like the um, retrofitting that um, when you add a ramp to a building that hadn't been there, um, it, it just looks awkward and sticks out. Thank you. So why do it? Um, we have research that shows us that, um, that post-school outcomes really are better when these kinds of things happen. And first and foremost, they're better when students are included in general ed classes. Um, you know, access to the general ed curriculum is what's required by the law, but those opportunities to learn alongside their peers without disabilities um, has been linked to those better outcomes. Um, having some work experience while, while they're in school, so really giving students that real world experience. Increasing self-determination skills are also linked to you know, better likelihood of having a job, increased hours at work, higher earnings, and staying on the job longer and having a job longer. And then the social skills are shown to be really important in keeping a job. Students are more, or young adults are more likely to lose a job because of social skills than because they didn't know how to do a step of the task. So universal design for learning, is really an evidence-based practice that can help us figure out how to really make inclusive education meaningful and useful and address all those multiple needs that students have um, to have improved outcomes. You know, it's, and most of you, you know, know this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but you know, universal design is not a set cookbook, it's not a set method, but it is a framework that helps us think that start first with students can all learn and then think planfully and ahead of time to think about the multiple means of content delivery and student assessment um, and then how to link those real world experiences to the instruction so that really increases student motivation. And you probably all know this as well, but you know, university, universal design for learning has three primary principles. So multiple means of representation, and that's the, the what of learning, providing options for how students will 
receive information, you know, auditory, visual, hands-on learning, multiple means of expression, the how, so providing options for students to demonstrate what they know and understand in multiple ways that fit for them, and then multiple means of engagement, you know, the why of learning. Um, you know, if you think back to your high school years, you probably one or two times said, why do I need to learn this? Um, and so the why, capturing that, showing students how what you're teaching them is linked to real world jobs, real world experiences, things that they um, can and might do in their future, um, really helps um, tap into that motivation to learn. Thanks. And I am just about out of, out of time, so I'm just going to let you know that these slides are here. But this can help you think about how to link um, the principles of UDL with differentiated learning and adaptation. So that if you're used to thinking about making adaptations, you can see how it could fit under the bigger umbrella of the UDL framework. So the next, this slide and the next slide can show you how that happens. And then this last one um, looks at those strategies related to transition and self-determination that can be linked to the UDL um, principles um, and framework. So thinking about um, using the self-determined learning model of instruction is a different way of presenting instruction to students and linking real world work to teach students how academics are used. Again, another way of linking um, to the multiple means of representation. So you'll, you will have this as part of your resources, and um, if there are questions about it, we can get to that later. I don't want to take everybody else's time. And again, these are some points to consider as you're thinking about moving forward. You know, again, if you're thinking about authentic tasks, what do people do in their jobs? What do they do for recreation? What do you do in college? And what are those skills in general that are needed to be a successful adult? And then how can that be linked to those academics? Thanks. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, I know we have some questions, but we will leave those for after uh, Dr. Diamond and Scott share with us their thoughts. And then um, for those of you who joined us after I already did our introductions, please, you can follow uh, the conversation kind of behind the scenes via Twitter using hashtag UDLIRN. And that's where you can post your questions and comments as well as here in the chat, although it is a little bit harder to follow it here in the chat. So uh, if you could please post them all on Twitter. And Dr. Diamond, it is your turn. Sure. Well, Alex has been so good to kind of try to help me with this technology thing. I'm a new uh, Zoom user, so this is all exciting, and I think I've located it. There we go. Oh, this is outstanding. So today I'm learning a new skill. Um, so let me back up here. So I'm Stacy Diamond. I actually have ties to VCU also, so you have three of us who have... <laughs> VCU background. Uh, it's my alma mater, so it's a pleasure to uh, to present with Colleen and Laurent today. Um, I'm going to share some information from a study we actually published about a decade ago. It feels like it's really old to share this, but um, given our conversation and having about 10 or 15 minutes to, to speak with you, um, I thought I would focus on some work that we did. You can read this if you ever want. Um, it is a, a study where we actually had federal funding to look at universally designing a um, uh, inclusive science class um, at the high school level and using principles of universal design. So um, I'm going to kind of quickly take you through that. Um, so unified science is typically taken in the ninth grade at a, a local school where we are at, and it is, um, I guess you call it the lowest level science class that you can get for high school credit. Um, the topics, the first semester focuses on forensic science. So um, things like learning the scientific method, um, uh, fingerprinting, blood typing, that kind of thing. Um, and then those other categories that are listed there are the second half the, of the year in terms of what students are doing. Um, unified science typically has students who um, 
are, are not always, um, shall we say, really motivated to learn. Um, and they're kids who are struggling in school, particularly at the high school level. Um, in this particular class, this was a co-taught class, and so there already were a number of students in there with high incidence disability who needed additional supports, um, but there were no students with severe intellectual disability included at the time that we started working with them. So the big question comes, why on earth do we even try high school science? Um, none of us had science backgrounds, really. Um, but we chose uh, unified science because as we thought about um, inclusion at the high school level and academic uh, curriculum, science seems to be an area where there's, there's really a lot of potential. You know, there's usually a lot of hands-on types of things. There's a lot of uh, functional application to everyday living. Um, and in addition, we had this great general ed teacher who was really excited about her content and really committed to the students that she worked with. Um, and she wanted to partner with us as well as her co-teacher to um, see if we could figure out ways to, to give better instruction for her students. So um, in general, what we ended up doing um, is, um, and I'm, I'm going to focus today a little bit more on our process than I am data that we took or, or anything like that. Um, it, it's more than what I can do and probably not quite as interesting. Um, but here's the process we used to take this class and, and to redesign it. Um, so we started in the first month or so. First of all, we introduced um, two students with severe disabilities um, to each of two sections of the unified science class. Um, and in bringing them in, um, we told the teachers, do what you think you would normally do, you know, you know, in having new students in your class. And what they would normally do is, is put those students who had more significant needs at the back of the classroom with a paraprofessional. Um, so they they included them by having them do the same things that every other student was doing in that class. So some of our initial redesign uh, practices that we did in collaboration with them was to change the seating location so that all students were integrated and students with severe disabilities weren't at the back of the classroom and they weren't sitting next to a paraprofessional. Um, we looked at varying the grouping patterns for all students so that um, kids had opportunities to work with all other students in the class. We provided choices uh, throughout those class sessions so they um, had a little bit more control over the things they were doing in class. We changed some staff roles around. Um, at, at the time we went in there, it was more of a one teach, one assist type of co-teaching. So the gen ed teacher did most of the teaching. The um, special ed co-teacher wandered around the room and helped as needed. And then when we had introduced the students with severe disabilities to the class, the paraprofessional sat next to them. So we tried to create an atmosphere where they all had more meaningful roles and were more actively engaged in working with all students. Um, at the end of each uh, class session, we were in there collecting data and, and um, working with them, but we would also um, kind of debrief with them very briefly at the end of their, their class, the gen ed teacher and the paraprofessional, to talk about strengths of what they did, problems they thought they encountered, and, and come up with maybe an idea for the next time. But it was a very brief, couple minutes. Um, we also, as part of our initial redesign, uh, tried to at least come up with whatever the main idea of the lesson would be so that we could figure out a way for the students with severe intellectual disabilities to be initially involved in that class content um, and tried as much as we could to make materials more concrete. So it kind of sounds like a lot, but these were kind of like quick types of things that we felt we could put into place um, really easily. Um, and, and once we got the class sort of up and running and changing some things, we um, looked at having a, a redesign meeting every week where we had a series of questions related to these five areas that we worked through and we gradually became a, a little bit more uh, complex in our, our thinking about issues of curriculum, instruction, materials, that type of thing. Um, but overall, our approach really was to look at redesigning the whole class first to um, help all students to feel included and part of that that class and actively engaged in, in learning. Um, and that's where the bulk of our, our work um, was for the first, uh, well, probably at least the half of the year, before we could look at more um, student-specific needs and those students who had um, needs for a more universally de designed classroom, but you know that universal design was hard to, to really think about in a meaningful way for those students. So here's our approach that we used on a weekly basis. And when I say we, I'm talking about uh, the gen ed teacher, the special ed co-teacher, the special ed teacher of students with severe disabilities, who, by the way, had more of a, a 
traditional self-contained class, although her students also went out in the community for, for instruction and had some, some integrated classes. Um, that was the school group. And then um, our grant funded staff um, included myself and uh, grant coordinator and, and a couple of other folks that were part of the um, data collection and redesign. So we would, um, the gen ed teacher and the school staff um, would meet together to look at the, the traditional lesson plan that the gen ed teacher would have typically used to teach that class. They'd brainstorm some ideas about how they might redesign it using the principles of redesign that we talked about. Um, and then our grant staff would also take that same um, traditional lesson plan and try to come up with some ideas. And then uh, it was sort of like one from each group came together, the gen ed teacher and the, our grant coordinator would meet and kind of come up with a tentative redesign lesson, how they could take that lesson, make it different. Um, we would give that lesson to the special ed teacher of students with severe disabilities so she could think um, more about her two students that were coming into the classroom because their needs um, and their, their learning goals were significantly different from the other students in the class. And then the following week, we'd all get together and um, hash through this and come up with a plan that we felt would work for all of the students in the class. So here's an example of what a traditional lesson plan would look like. Um, you know, we would receive information like this. Here's a, a lesson you can see that was more on the solar system with some outcomes of what students were supposed to be able to do. It was going to be a one week unit. Um, this traditional lesson plan is very typical of the way that the teacher taught and organized her instruction. Um, students always started with a journal. They would do some individual work on a note sheet using a textbook. And they'd have this whole group discussion where they would put uh, transparencies up and they'd um, go over the notes and make sure students had the correct answers. And then students would work either individually or with a partner to complete a worksheet using the textbook. So this is probably more typical of um, high school instruction and in that we do a lot of seat work and um, notes and books and those types of things. And our redesign was really to try to um, you know, give some more opportunities, some different ways of learning that might be uh, more motivating to the group. So here's, here's a sample redesigned lesson. This is the same lesson you just looked at. They still came in and did the journal because that was a way for them settling down and, and kind of getting oriented. We took the students and divided them into four research teams and had uh, each team uh, focus on one aspect of the unit. Um, we assigned students roles within that group and taught them what those roles meant um, in order to make sure that they were able to complete the work and to involve everybody on their team, including students with severe disabilities, um, in those um, activities. We pre-taught the behaviors um, that we expected them to use for collaboration. Um, now, we didn't spend a great deal of time on this. We would pick one you know, area of collaboration we wanted, um, and we would talk them through what it would look like and sound like and you know, how to, how to do that. Um, we held them accountable for their learning by um, making sure they had some permanent products they had to have at the end. So in this particular lesson, we wanted them to produce a handout of important concepts related to their area, to come up with some type of a demonstration or little mini lab that they created, um, and also a PowerPoint or inspiration or website presentation. And so the teams would work across the week. The teachers had a, a collaboration uh, checklist that they used to evaluate how students were working together and also were there to um, support and assist students as needed. And then on the last day, they presented their research to the rest of the class. So, you know, we didn't expect everybody to have to engage in every single part of the lesson, but that way they had a little bit of choice about, you know, somebody really liked, you know, more the hands-on stuff. Maybe they would do the demonstration. Somebody more technology-oriented might, you know, work with another student do the website presentation, that type of thing. So um, general outcomes, um, and again, I'm not sharing data with you, but in general, what we saw um, is in terms of the students with, um, um, with and without disabilities, we saw more active engagement in learning, more interactions with peers, um, decreases in behaviors that we consider to interfere with learning, you know, sleeping or walking away from whatever it is they were supposed to be doing. We saw decreases in that. We saw some increases in terms of the gen ed teacher not being just the, the lead teacher in the classroom, but really interacting with all kids, including the students with severe disabilities. Um, and the paraprofessionals um, that would come in for each class, we also found that we were able to help them to find other ways of being involved in the class um, and not just um, having so many interactions with students with severe disabilities. Some things we learned from this process, um, at least in our 
particular small case in this um, this one classroom we worked with um, with these great school staff um, is that we really found that we had to spend time creating an inclusive learning environment for um, the class for the teachers teaching them how to collaborate together um, and really think about learning for all kids before we could even focus on the curriculum um, so um, if you look at sort of that bullet on evolution of change, you know, the first thing particularly as it relates to kids with severe disabilities, we were looking at, at getting their physical presence there and not just in the back of the room. And once we got that set up and that was working well and nothing bad was happening, so to speak, you know, we were looking more at interactions between um, a variety of kids and teachers. And once that was sort of more stable and we sort of had a routine of there, we were able to move into um, students' IEP goals for kids with more significant disabilities, identifying a learning goal. And that seemed to be really key. Once we were able to get to that place where particularly the Jenna teacher and even the special ed co-teacher could say, oh, okay, this is what's important for them to learn. They really kind of had an aha moment and that helped them to think um, not only about the IEP objectives, but the fact that they really could target potentially science curriculum for the students too. Um, but it took us almost a year to get there until the point where we could actually work on some science, science content for students. Um, what we also learned is that change doesn't happen overnight. I mean, we were in there several times a week for an entire school year um, and things happen. You know, kids don't show up, a uh, teacher goes on maternity leave or whatever it is. Um, you know, you put things in place, somebody forgets the materials. You know, it, it just doesn't always go the way you plan because that's, that's teaching. Um, we did find that there was really a, a need to have a commitment for time um, from all of the stakeholders, um, which we did, but it was, it was a lot of their time and they realized that. Um, and again, we felt that redesign started with thinking about the whole class, not just the students with severe disabilities. So very quickly, because I know I'm also at the end of my time, um, what the teachers learned, I think this is, this is very telling, this is what they told us that they learned. These were experienced teachers, um, who felt that you know, they could easily walk into a classroom and just kind of go with the flow. And what they learned from this process of trying to make things universal designed is that they really needed to go through formal planning and that they needed to work together in the planning process, the co-teacher and the special ed teacher and the gen ed teacher. Um, they couldn't just kind of walk in and expect things to go. So I think that was a, a real eye opener for them. Um, Jenna teacher also talked about needing to provide more guidance to teaching assistants for delivering individualized instruction that she felt that she learned how to do that and that that really she felt leaving this that this was the Jenna teacher's role. Um, and probably the last thing I'll leave you in um, so that I, I don't cut off Laron here is um, choice making does not come naturally to all students. So here's a little brief story. Um, at the end of the year, after going through all this redesign, um, teachers had a day where they, they just went back to the worksheets that they were doing, the typical traditional lesson. And what they told us from that was, you know, the students were much better behaved. I think they learned more then. And I think it, what it told us was, is that they equated quiet students with learning more. And so I think there is a process by which when one does universally design something, you know, there can be a lot of commotion and activity and talking and interaction. And if you're not accustomed to teaching that, you can think that maybe kids aren't in fact learning when they are. So I'll, I'll close with that. I'll turn that back over to you all. And I think I've gotten rid of my thing, yes? Yes, <clears throat> yes, you have. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, Dr. Laron Scott, it's your turn to take the stage. And for all of you who are joining us, please post your questions and comments on Twitter using the hashtag UDLIRN. All right. So I've been asked to talk a little about the, um, to, to a certain degree, what do we do with this information? Uh, what do teachers do? What uh, do our preparation programs do uh, with this information uh, that's coming out? And uh, what we know is most recently with the passage of the Every Student uh, Succeeds Act of 2015, which added a number of requirements that specifically call for the use of universal design for learning uh, in both assessment uh, and instructions. Uh, states must define in their plan for students taking alternative assessments, 
uh, the steps taken to incorporate UDL in assessments uh, to the students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. Uh, essentially, so ESSA also requires states to develop a comprehensive literacy plan incorporating the UDL principles. Uh, in particular, this comprehensive plan uh, should be developmentally appropriate, contextually explicit, uh, and systematically, uh, and system systematically. Uh, complete it and include frequent practice in reading and writing across content areas. So the focus is on the teacher's collaborative practice for planning, instructing, and assessing student progress. Uh, and lastly, uh, what ESSA is requiring is states to use funds that increase access to personalized and rigorous learning experiences supported by technology. And so when we think about this, the use of technology in schools is pretty consistent with the principles of UDL. And these changes in the educational policy has implications for uh, the preparation of teachers. So not only must they have sufficient knowledge of the general education curriculum, they must also be able to address the other needs of students uh, with disabilities, which could include teaching activities of daily living, social and self-determination skills, uh, transition goals such as vocational education, independent living skills, and community living skills. So some of that information that uh, Dr. Toma first covered uh, during her, her talk. Uh, so in 2015, the national goals for research policy and practice for students with intellectual disabilities uh, brought together researchers, policy advocates, practitioners, individuals with intellectual disabilities and uh, other disabilities, family and family members to discuss uh, the current status of education and develop a national agenda for the future. And I had the pleasure of serving on that committee along with Dr. Toma, which was lots of fun. Um, and the education group, uh, which was a subcommittee for this panel, uh, goals included one that urged the field to identify effective personnel prep preparation and professional development practices that ensure general and special education teachers can implement a UDL framework. So most of the research uh, on the literature in the field of UDL and some of that uh, connection between the academic and transition component uh, has focused on the principles of universal design for learning and implementation techniques. So uh, one uh, set of researchers found that after receiving UDL training that special educators were able to collaborate uh, with general educators and the development of inclusive lessons uh, for students with disabilities. So what we gather from that is implementing a UDL framework included in a general education setting uh, was, uh, can be effective, uh, but that was just a, a portion of the research uh, that was more prevalent. Some other research uh, actually tar targeted uh, institutes of higher ed and also followed, uh, followed in the trend of not only preparing future educators to use UDL in practice, uh, but also uh, embedding the UDL framework into, the, into uh, their own practice. And so uh, when we look at where most of the research and, and even some of the research lie, uh, it was in the implementation uh, for uh, general educators and special educators uh, in the classroom. Uh, and it was also at the higher education level, uh, where some of the research we still needed to uh, gather more information uh, was understanding to what extent are teachers actually able to implement universal design for learning into their practices and how universities are preparing them to do so. And, and so despite some of these studies and policies that call for the infusion of UDL of the UDL framework and teacher preparation programs, uh, there was little information available about the degree to which UDL is actually infused in pre-service coursework. 
and even less about whether it was being applied as a strategy to link uh, academic and some of that transition and functional education goals for uh, students with disabilities. And so I'll just highlight a couple of studies that uh, we just recently uh, recently completed and uh, my colleague Dr. Toma talked uh, a little about the study that uh, looked at um, some of our teachers in the field who uh, struggled with linking uh, UDL and, and that transition planning uh, component. So I won't, uh, I'll try not to cover that too much, but uh, on the right side of the screen, you'll see uh, the second study that I'll uh, highlight a little more, which was uh, a study relating to, uh, well, it was actually sent to uh, special education programs uh, on the uh, National Council for Accreditation of Teacher Education or NCATE. Um, uh, organization and the what we were looking at is um, teachers being prepared to instruct students with uh, disabilities while enrolled in programs so because special education and preparation programs have a central role in preparing teachers to work with students with with disabilities it is also important that programs are incorporating the universal design for learning framework to actually prepare those teachers to meet the demand of the policy. So although a high percentage of programs uh, in this study reported implementation of, of each general UDL strategy uh, that was a part of the innovation configuration matrix, uh, matrix and I won't go into too many details about that, uh, but only about a quarter of those programs were actually implementing those UDL components at the highest level. And so what this suggests is that although a high percentage of programs are reporting preparing teachers to have a general understanding of the UDL framework, there are variances in the degree of preparation. And perhaps many educators may not be receiving preparation that includes applying their knowledge in settings where students with disabilities, uh, students with disabilities are. Uh, and this is also the same with preparation, the preparation with planning instruction. Uh, and what that means is that practice applying these strategies in a natural setting may be limited. So when we talk about uh, applying uh, uh, the UDL strategy in settings uh, in classrooms, in field experience, in, in student teaching opportunities, in uh, these field placements, uh, the application of this may be limited, uh, and that's an area that uh, we could possibly look at for enhancement. And so we, you know, we know that uh, the significance of implementation of education practice, educational practice and instruction and special education uh, preparation. Uh, so in particular, uh, pre-service special education teachers uh, and practice implementing instructional practices, uh, when there's an absence of these opportunities, they can, they can lead to future issues with fidelity uh, around implementing those practices. So if they're not getting those opportunities in their preparation programs, there's the potential for actually going into the field and not uh, being able to apply those uh, effectively. So the findings for uh, these studies were overwhelming and revealing that uh, courses that in incorporate a UDL framework, uh, they, while preparation programs were doing this to some degree, uh, what was also missing was a link to transition standards. And uh, again, this may suggest that although programs are preparing teachers to have an understanding of the UDL framework, they may not be preparing teachers to find the, those natural links that Dr. Toma talked about uh, between meeting both the academic and transition goals of students with disability, which is that critical premise of the universal design for transition framework. Um, so there are, again, some missed opportunities in the preparation of, of educators to actually implement a UDL uh, framework. Um, but despite you know, some of the research evidence that suggests 
practical experience and instructional design and, um, and or developing lesson plans is effective way to structure training, uh, we do know uh, that you know, these results um, indicate that there is some level of awareness of the importance of preparing special educators to actually apply uh, UDL. So that's a, that, that's a promising uh, kind of takeaway from the study uh, that we completed is as preparation programs are aware, they're aware of the, uh, the policy uh, that's trickling down, they are aware of the importance of, 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 of UDL and why uh, teachers need to have uh, this uh, need to have and understand this framework, uh, but clearly more research uh, and more uh, practice is desired and required on this topic. So, you know, anything subsequent should probably focus on collecting uh, artifacts uh, from these preparation programs like syllab syllabi and course assignments and lesson plans to actually, uh, you know, one, verify that uh, the UDL component is actually implemented to uh, a certain degree in the program, but also uh, what are the ways that are uh, those programs and those, those, those faculty members can link that UDL framework with transition. So and I'll leave it there. Some of thank, you, thank you so much. So I will get our conversation started with the first very general question to all of you. <clears throat> Uh, as we know, UDL promises, the framework promises learning for all students, but when we start searching for students with severe disability in inclusive classrooms, uh, we might have difficulty finding them. So as you all think of students with severe intellectual disability and inclusive practices, what do you think needs to happen in order for UDL to move from being a promise to become a practice? And please just Take turns. <laughs> I'm not going to call on you. <laughs> well, maybe I'll go first. Go, oh. Stacy. So, um, what will it take? Hmm. Um, I I think it's a hard. Uh, that's a really hard question, but very important question, Alex. Because, um, it, you know, the reality is that we're battling right now, even seeing how um, students with severe intellectual disability can be in gen ed classes. So even when we talk about access to the general ed curriculum, you know, the law doesn't say that it has to be in a gen ed class. It just says they have to have access to the curriculum. And so I think that does complicate things um, for a number of places, a number of schools, and um, trying to figure out how to engage kids in, in a meaningful way. And so to, um, to move forward with that, I guess, you know, based on our, our limited experience, at least engaging in teachers and talking with them is that, you know, part of the way that you make this happen is really, um, it, you've got to be vested. First of all, you've got to want it. You know, you've got to value all students in your class and, and you've got to be excited about kind of teaching to a broader array and maybe teaching differently. And if you're not really interested in doing that, you know, then that's probably not going to be a good class, maybe for, for many kids. Um, you know, I would, I would argue that um, I think a lot of the ways sometimes that we choose to teach in schools, and again, I'm not, I'm not talking about everybody, but sometimes there are ways that people choose to teach, particularly in the upper grades, that is that more didactic lecture, like we're doing right now, right? We're talking, you know, and not everybody gets it. And so it's not even working for all kids without disabilities, much less kids who really struggle to learn. So I think, you know, as a system, we need to really look carefully at how we want to prepare kids and teach in a variety of ways. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think some of what Laron and my study showed as well is, you know, it needs to start with us in higher ed and how we prepare our teachers. And we have to stop preparing um, special educators in one silo and general ed teachers in another silo and principals in a third silo. Um, we really have to model that true collaboration and that true um, universal design for learning framework within our courses because people tend to teach the way they were taught mm -hmm. and you know just as um, Lauren was talking about earlier if we're not giving um, our teachers or our principals as they're being um, prepared opportunities to implement what they are learning to um, get feedback about how well they're implementing those strategies, 
um, then it's less likely they're going to end up doing that with the students in their classroom. Great. Thank you. Laron, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I think uh, they, they both did a good job of covering uh, the topic. <laughs> and so I, I agree. I think implementation, uh, those opportunities uh, to see uh, these frameworks being modeled is uh, particularly uh, important and and uh, we have to do a better job of, of, of showing that. Great, thank you. And we have Brian Dean with UDLIRN who is monitoring Twitter feed for us. And so Brian, can you, can you shoot some questions for our great Ooh. panelists? How much time do we have, Alex? Ten I've got, I've got it. Okay, I've got a couple. <laughs> <clears throat> I've got some great people out there today asking some, some really big uh, questions. So um, I'll just pose them out there and uh, you guys uh, do the toss up to see who gets to answer them first. Uh, so the first one uh, comes from Lisa McCuller, um, also known as at Desert Sensei, uh, Sensei if you want to follow her. Uh, and her question is, what is the most impact, impactful practice you recommend for supporting teachers before it becomes ugly? And I think this is um, in response to kind of your presentation, Dr. Toma, but, um, but I think that everybody can kind of add to that. So one more time, what is the most impactful practice you recommend for supporting teachers before it becomes quote unquote ugly? Yeah, I really think it is giving them opportunities to practice, um, giving them opportunities to be in the classroom and implement it and giving them feedback as they go. And we have, unfortunately, too little of that in our teacher preparation programs. You know, we've got a 13 or 14 week student teaching and maybe we observe them four or five times. Um, and, you know, that may not be enough to change practice and really give them the opportunities to practice everything they've learned throughout their um, preparation program. But Dr. Toma, I, I have to interject and, and ask this burning question that I have as well. Is there a way you think that, um, that the pre-service teaching uh, that's going on can be combined with the induction process of teachers within districts? Can we, is, that, is that where we can maybe start to make some of this room so that we can get this observation? Is there partnerships? Do you know of partnerships that are starting to happen where um, districts are taking their induction plans and their induction programs and trying to marry them up uh, with, with, as an extension of the pre-service? Yes, definitely. And um, so induction after, so in their first two or three years, giving lots of so support and help after they finish the program. There's also models out there where um, the cooperating teacher gets some information about some of these practices because they may have been trained, you know, 10, 20 years ago before some of these things were implemented and they're great teachers and they're, you know, still motivated teachers. They just need some of these new strategies as well. Um, so models where, um, where you're thinking holistically about how do we train teachers and train not just our pre-service, but as you said, in-service and cooperating teachers um, seem to have a lot more impact. And Laurent, I think, has infused some of that into some of his programs as well. Yeah, I, I, I guess to go back to uh, the, the question, I think exposure is uh, critically important for all of our teachers and uh, is a necessary part of training. Uh, as you kind of alluded to, there are different models uh, that have uh, been uh, shown to be uh, kind of trial and error to some degree and to another degree they are showing some level of, of, of effectiveness. We have some residency programs, we have some uh, interdisciplinary programs that are uh, really doing a great job of, of, of giving uh, our pre-service teachers uh, an opportunity to work across the aisle uh, with our general education uh, teachers, with school counselors, with principals, with social workers, and with others uh, in the field so that they can learn from each other on how to uh, deal with some of uh, those uh, learning and uh, behavioral challenges that uh, often impact uh, uh, instruction and often impact some of the other challenges that they face. Uh, 
I think that um, I think that's a that's a, a beautiful model of both implementation science combined with um, in iterative design and how those kind of work in the volatility of districts, especially especially looking at new teachers and what we see from new teachers and how long new teachers look to be in one place and what their training begins to look like and all of those pieces. I think that's a um, I think that's a cool model to explore. I think you guys are doing some big work. So um, I appreciate those, uh, both of those insights. Um, I have another one that uh, I think is, again, kind of around, <clears throat> uh, kind of around the, the practical side of things. And, and it uh, comes from our very own Sue Harden at S. Harden 22. Uh, and she asks, uh, how can we design instruction so that students with significant needs um, choose their own modifications? Are they choosing instruction? Does it come from instruction or opportunity models? How do we start really working that so that uh, even our students with significant needs are, are, are really starting to make those choices towards that, that higher level of UDL of, of uh, you know, executive functioning and, and um, working with those pieces? So, I think a part of uh, that goes back to uh, that UDT framework that we, we talked about uh, with being able to uh, piece, piece together the academics and that functional and transition uh, sort of uh, responsibility that we all have um, as, you know, as teachers and, um, and utilizing that as an opportunity to engage uh, our students in uh, in instruction uh, that will help to you know sort of meet uh, meet meet the needs of of, of, of students with you know both uh, high and low incidence uh, disabilities. As a you know as a, a former teacher who uh, kind of struggled with some of that myself, and um, incorporating that that UDT framework, there uh, were uh, you know it really motivated me to uh, get my students involved in making choices about uh, what were um, you know some, some things that were of interest to them that could be incorporated in, into those uh, th those lessons and activities that, uh, that that we worked on and so I think uh, again taking a look back at that UDT framework may be a, a first step that I would recommend Excellent. Um, any, any, any other pieces? I see, Colleen, you came off uh, mute, so yeah. I, won't, I won't let you jump in on that. I see you chomping at the bit. She wants to go. Go for well, it. <laughs> I actually wanted to go back to a point that Stacy made, that sometimes you do have to teach choice making. And um, you know, that's one of the myths with self-determination is that if you can't make choices and you know, do all these things for yourself, then, um, then maybe self-determination isn't for you but it really is a continuum. And so you really have to figure out where is that student and then how do you build and um, help him or her move forward. So it may be, um, you know, choice making just, you know, do you want to wear the red, red shirt or the blue shirt today, um, all the way up to a problem solving approach where you know there's an issue, but you don't even know the options that exist. And so those kinds of experiences are really helpful. And for some students, especially with limited vocabulary, it may be thinking about alternative ways for them to communicate, bringing their support folks in who could also um, share experiences. You know, at home, they may show this preference that you didn't see in the classroom. So parents or siblings, um, peers can really help with um, getting that starting point. So I, I, I love the framing of this as well. Like you can, I don't know if you guys realize this, but you, you're pretty brilliant folks. Um, so so I love the framing of this idea because there's more than just what's happening. It's not a linear function, right? It's not this linear continuum that happens. While this is happening, while piece A is kind of falling into place and we're kind of looking at it, we also have to look at how we scaffold choice within the environment. Then we also have to look at how are we scaffold choicing uh, with, with um, outside help, right, and out in community. And then while we're doing that, how are we directly influencing and, and teaching students how to begin making choices, simple choices, within what they do? Um, so that just begins to sum up 
this, this kind of issue with UDL, right? This beautiful issue with UDL, but this issue with UDL and its complexity. And how do you implement it at a superficial level? And then how do you Im implement it in this all encompassing kind of way? Um, and so I, I appreciate that. I think that that's, um, that's one of the beautiful parts of UDL, but it's one of the hard ones to grab onto. Um, and I think we're running short on time, so I want to throw it back to you. There are tons of questions. They are in our Twitter chat. Um, uh, if I see that you've been in there, Dr. Toma, and, and if uh, anybody else wants to answer those, please feel free to. Thank you, Brian, for feeding the questions to our panelists. Um, thank you all for, for sharing your thoughts and experiences. Uh, and thank you to the viewers uh, for posting your questions. I just wanted quickly to remind you all that we will continue these the conversations around UDL during the UDL IRN Summit that will be at the end of March in Orlando, starting with a pre-conference on March 29th. Um, and you can still register at udlirn.org. Um, moreover, there is a challenge, Crusader challenge for the summit. And if you want to read more about it, check UDLIRN website, follow us on Twitter, ask questions to Brian Dean, who is in charge of that challenge. And then thank you all. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, the panelists, for sharing your, your wisdom with us. And everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. It was great.